work with? Okay. Yeah. Okay. I had to stop the recording because it was, I guess it reached its limit, so I just restarted yep. it again. Okay. Um, and we talked about the witnesses, that you need to know that information before you can give witnesses that could give helpful information. And a party, like, part of the law is that when you give the witness, when you give the name of the witness, you can tell the judge what information this witness could give that's relevant. Like, in civil law, don't you often have affidavits from witnesses? Or what do you do, yes. like, when you do the, the lawyer questions the person in advance before they go on the stand? Right, you do an affidavit or you do, yeah, you just, um, yeah, every, and it has to be given, like it has to be shown to the other party. The judge won't even, it, it was, you would take a deposition, you know, the judge won't even, it won't be admissible in court. Unless if the, if the other side got notice of it. Even if you get it like last minute, like they'll call it like unreasonable surprise or something, you know, like you can't, just can't. You have to, yeah, you know, yeah. You have to have the, everything's got to go to the other side, and that's even before the trial. Before the yes. trial happens, everything has to go to the all other the side. Stuff, so, all the yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And in canon law, there is a part where the other side gets to see everything. My concern is they let the respondent see it way too late, as compared to letting the person know what's going on in the beginning. They let him right. know kind they of at the end. How do you build a case if you don't even know what you're, what they're alleging? You don't know what people are saying. You have to get their testimony. Yeah. So, yep. And and the, the the canon law doesn't say that the judges is required to give the party all the testimony as they collect it, but it does say that they have to give them a copy of a legitimate petition that has to include the grounds and the person's own description of what facts support the grounds they're alleging. I mean, it's a simple thing. Simple thing to provide somebody with, and it's just, I think it's, you know, a lack of due process, but, you know, it's the church, they can do whatever they, well, it's in canon law that says they have to, so they're, they're violating their own rules. Yeah, and the, the rest of this, there's, a, there's one more section of this letter, and then it gets really technical, because I start quoting a canon law professor at Catholic U. So let's okay. go over to um, declining to send the tribunal proofs prematurely. Mm -hmm. Um I think I'm just going to talk about this one rather than, than read it, because we kind of covered it already. But this gives a, a bullet point list for a defendant, a defending respondent that just says, look, I want to participate. I just want to do it in the proper manner so that I have the right information before I participate. And before I start giving any testimony, answering a questionnaire, I want to get my own copy of an actual petition signed by the petitioner. Like, if it's not signed by the petitioner, who knows? Like, the, the, anyone could have written it. Like, that's really important. <laughs> And 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 um, you want the petitioner to do what they're supposed to do, which is say the grounds and support it. But then um, also the judicial vicar is the one that's supposed to be accepting the petition because I have seen cases where letters are going to you, but instead of being signed by the judge where it looks like a real signature, you can tell it was put on with a the computer. They're all exactly the same. So if all the signatures of the, ju the judicial vicar are exactly the same, or the judge are exactly the same, that raises the question, did the judge even look at this? And oh, yeah. I can imagine a scenario where I work in an office and I have been given the authority by the judge that I'm the, the auditor or whoever I am. I'm somebody who's been working at a tribunal. I can type fast. And I don't know the canon law. I don't understand any of these complaints that someone might be making. But my job is to notify petitioners. My job is to accept petitions. So when I, tribunal worker lady, receive a petition, I just generate a letter and I stick my computer signature on it. It's the same form letter all the time. So then it raises the question, if the person, if the person who doesn't have competence to do it is doing it, it's another kind of thing where it doesn't count. It's not real. It's not a real, yeah. It's not a real acceptance of a petition oh. if it's not signed by the judge. Or at least the judge didn't see it and the one who authorized the signing. Because I still never had a clear answer on whether these ink-stamped or computer-generated signatures count. But they certainly mm -hmm. raise the question. Yeah, they do. Yeah. So that, that's another reason. And then um, that's why people want, they want their own copy of the judicial vicars accepting the petition. And then they want their own copy of the judge identifying the grounds that are going to be investigated. 
because part of oh, so you're even asking for the, a copy of a letter of the judge accepting it. Yep, that's the notification that it's going to be accepted by the judicial vicar. Okay. When when okay. you get cited, you're supposed to get the copy of the petitioner's petition and a copy of the judge's acceptance of it. Yep, both of those. And if you don't get it, because this rarely happens. This rarely. Well, part part of the part of the um, the problem for defending respondents could be, let's say the petitioner did sign it and they did allege a grounds and they allege grave lack of discretion of judgment. Okay, and then the facts and proofs in a general way that they gave was, hey, my wife is a jerk. When I married her, I didn't know she was such a piece of work, and we got in terrible fights and we broke up because we weren't compatible. Let's just say they wrote that on the petition. Well. Sure. The tribunal auditor has no idea and has not supposed to be expected to know whether that's a good enough reason to do a case. But the judicial okay. vicar is supposed to know that. And you as a respondent could receive that petition and write back and say, excuse me, what they just wrote is about like our arguments that happened 10 and 17 years into our marriage. That has absolutely nothing to do with him suffering a grave psychopathology. And you have to have the ground. I, so basically what's going on is they're going to collect what the petitioner says. Then they're just going to send their questionnaire and they're going to hear what we have to say. But we're, we're just talking in a general way. We don't even know what the petitioner is alleging. And now we're just asserting our rights with this letter so we can get our, what I would call due process. Right. Yeah. And, and if someone who's not competent or qualified or allowed to accept in a petition like some lady who just works with the tribunal that does what she was told and she's been doing the same thing for 10 years. If she's mm -hmm. the one's making these judgments because we have these that's ink stamp signatures not, that are fake. So that girl is supposed to not. You're, okay, you're, so that's, yep. This letter shows you how to raise a question about that. So if you see those signatures, it's just rubber stamp. It's boiler. They need a boiler plate signature. Yeah. Okay. And I mean, you can tell now with software, like I can just take signatures and I put them all next to each other and I make them opaque and you put them on top of each other and they're exactly the same. Like, okay. Mm -hmm. Something's, something's puzzling here. It's not a real signature. So then the part where it gets really, where I use these quotes from this professor, Daniel, um, this is hard, Irene. <laughs> um, we have, we got, you got all this uh, law to defend because otherwise they just keep doing this. How, how can we do this last part? Um, 4.11, are we alone? Well, we're kind of at 9, 9 and 10, 9 and 10 and 11 and 12. Um, I'm, I'm almost of the mind that I can summarize and We'll see where it goes with you and me talking about it. Because this, okay. this part 9, 10, and 11, um, I quote Professor William Daniel. And mm -hmm. he is now like a consultant consultor at the world's highest tribunal, the Apostolic Signatura, where Cardinal Raymond Burke used to be. So it's like if, if someone is aggrieved by what their local tribunal does, you can mm -hmm. appeal to the Holy See and you go to the Roman Rota. And if you're aggrieved by what the Roman Rota does, depending on what it is, you can go higher. And that's where you go to the Apostolic Signatura. So this Professor William Daniel is now a consultor there. The title they use is referendi. And um, so to me, that tells me that the people at the Holy See respect this guy. So okay. some of the findings that I share, and I've got him quoted in this, this rebuttal, is he's talking about how someone could be in a position to have a case at the Signatura where they are trying to get corrected, a local tribunal that does one of two things that are should be void and null as if they never happen. And mm -hmm. one of the things is the, the, the petition itself, if they start a case without a petition, then the whole case is void and null. Like, you know, if I was mad at my roofer and I submitted my diary to the judge and the roofer was like, ha, 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 pay me half, of, you know, a bunch of money and we'll give him a fine. That would be illegal. Uh -huh. Canon law is the same way. <laughs> if you if a petitioner gives a diary to the judge and then they issue an annulment, that's illegal. <clears throat> so anyways, Professor Daniel has this article in the scholarly canon law journal describing, I mean, he doesn't use my stupid examples. He uses very technical mm -hmm. words, but it's that the, 
the um, starting a case without a petition is a reason that the whole case is null. So okay. that's one of the things that's addressed in these last couple paragraphs. And then the case other, is, go ahead. Like the case is dismissed. It's dismissed. It's like they have to, there's no, it, it's just grounds to throw it out. Right. It's, yeah. yeah, it's, um, the sentence is irremediably null. The mm. sentence cannot be repaired. Like there's some kind of things that are remediably null. That's hard to say, but it's remediable, it's fixable. So it's like if the judge forgot to put a signature on it, okay, he can fix that. If they got the date of your wedding wrong and it was a clerical error, they can fix that. But if, if they started a case without a real petition, it's irremediably null. The whole thing is void. It shouldn't happen. So part of the reason I've got this in here is because the petitioner who's um, disheartened that the tribunal is doing this has set himself up from the very beginning to have a, an appeal that gave the information to the judge with the intention of if this goes all the way to the top, I'm, I'm setting myself up to go to the signatory yep. and ask, yep. ask them to intervene and correct the local tribunal if the tribunal needs correcting. And according to what William Daniel writes, they need correcting if they're doing this. So the, the other thing he's talking about is that the judge's acceptance can also be a null juridic act, the decree where the judge accepts the case. Because in canon law, when the judge does something, unless it's a really boring thing like scheduling an appointment or it's like, hey, we're giving you three weeks to do such and so, um, the judge's decrees are null juridic acts unless he gives reasons. So when the judge, and, and part of that is if his reasons were unfounded, the aggrieved party needs to know his reasons in order to appeal it. Right. You have to know. You have to know what you're appealing. Yeah. So when the judge issues his decree accepting a petition, he usually doesn't give reasons. He just says he accepts it. But what Professor Daniel talks about is when you put the petition next to the judge's decree accepting the petition together, those are the reasons for acceptance. Because the law lists the elements that are required. So if it has a signature and he accepts it, and the law says it needs a signature, well, that's one of the reasons he accepted it. If it needs to list the grounds and he accepted it, and the law says it needs grounds, okay, that's his reason. His reason for accepting it is the grounds that are in the petition. So even though he doesn't say the reasons, the law itself provides the reasons when you put the petition and the degree of acceptance together. So Professor mm -hmm. Daniel talks about how you could claim that his decree of acceptance also is void when the petition doesn't have what it has to have. Right. And it was easier was, to just tell you about this than try to read it, because that's mm -hmm. that's yeah. what the rest of this is about. It's giving it's giving quotes from Professor Daniel. Oh oh. There's one last one. Um, Monsignor Cormac Burke. I have a book on my shelf by him published by Scepter. Wait, the Scepter or Sophia? Scepter or Sophia. I think it's Sophia Press. Anyways, um, this guy, this, this Roman Rota judge, which is the tribunal between the local tribunals and the highest one at the Signatura, he was super pro-marriage. And um, so his cases are quoted a lot by people who are trying to support the validity of the marriage. And the last quote I have on here is noteworthy jurisprudence from the Roman Rota. Um, the judge should re reject the libellus in the beginning if the petitioner is saying grave lack of discretion of judgment, which is 1095, and the petitioner mentions nothing about psychological problems. So I just give a quote from him in one of his Roman Rota cases, where it's like, if, if this person who alleged grave lack of discretion of judgment doesn't describe any signs or symptoms that make present or prove this serious psychopatholo psychopathological, psychopathological <laughs> anomaly... Psychic anomaly? So they just say 10, but they don't say what the grounds are to support 1095. Um, it's, right? it's giving facts to support a 1095. Okay. So he's talking about the kind of facts. Um, it follows for a libellus to be accepted under 1095, there must be some allegation of a gravely mm. anomalous condition present at the moment of marriage in the person accused of consensual incapacity, accompanied by assertions or claims relating to signs, 
symptoms or events, which if substantiated, could make the presence of such an anomaly more likely. If nothing gravely anonymous is alleged, if nothing is asserted that could point to at least the possibility of a grave psychic anomaly, if there's no pre-wedding or post-wedding medical history <clears throat> of some definite psychic disorder, if all that is spoken of is simple immaturity or commonplace character defects, etc., then there is good reason to consider that the labella should not be accepted as clearly mm -hmm. lacking in sufficient foundation. <clears throat> Church tribunals are not fulfilling their essential ecclesiastical role when they devote time to cases without substance, lacking the minimum fumus boni iuris, which suggests that there is a true issue of justice to be resolved. Fumus bonus iuris, it's smoke, good law. It's like where there's smoke, there's fire. I mm -hmm. think it's smoke, good law. Mm -hmm. So it's like, like if your husband were to petition for an annulment, is he going to describe how he was in and out of psychiatric wards when he got married? Mine's not. So, so it's, the judge is supposed to be rejecting the case from the beginning unless the petition describes these serious psychic problems. And I'm afraid that a lot are letting petitions go through that have none of that. Seems like. The, and there, did you get any cases where they won't? I didn't realize that they can reject the p petition. I thought everyone that every petition they get, they open up an investigation, but they actually have grounds to reject it. Do they, they ever reject it? Well, Cormac Burke says they should. Yeah, they should. I, mean, I, they... I have seen situations where, um, like, someone like you would be notified and they might, you might be given a copy of a petition, and the petitioner might say, grave lack of discretion of judgment on me, you simulated good of the spouses, you simulated openness to children. So it's like they put, a, they put several grounds in there, and then when you respond, you would respond, look, I have kids, so this is ridiculous to waste our time investigating this, or I certainly wanted marriage, and I'd be pleased to give you or, you know, I'm intended permanence or whatever. Like you, you would give a real short description saying why you think what he put in his petition is just like a waste of time. So I have seen situations where judges originally say they're going to do multiple grounds and then they back down when they actually investigate the case and they only do oh. one ground. Okay. Which makes it easier, yes. you know, at least you've got, you're not wasting your energy on telling your whole life story when it's irrelevant. Right. Well, I mean, that went a lot longer than I thought it would, but I think for the person who had questions, like your average person is not going to be interested in this, but the person who's in that situation. I mean, unless you get anomaly papers. I mean, fortunately, you know, I haven't got them yet, but it's just. It's not worth talking about. You know, because how do you deal with all this? Because it's just like the civil. Yeah, you do the best you can. There is something I did want to touch on. I have heard respondents being reluctant to use a letter like this because they feel like it's so impersonal. It's so harsh. It's so, um, it's like they just want to say, we and I, it's like they don't want to tick off the judge is how I feel. It's like, hey, I want this judge well, to yeah, they're like, well, yeah. Well, like, it's funny because I did a separate, this is going a little off topic. I did a separation decree and that is now being investigated because my tribunal violated their own canon laws and they know it and they know, they know my name and they would love, you know, my husband to file for the moment. And then I know it would be granted because, you know, you just, they, they you know, they handle the annulments and they handle like the, 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 the separation decree. So it could shoot me, you know, later on, like, because I'm sure they're not happy. <laughs> You know, so, but what are you going to do? Yeah, you don't want to, but these are procedure grounds, so. So some people might not want to hold their ground because the tribunal would be more likely to go against them if they tried to hold their ground? I don't think so. I mean, it depends. I mean, everybody gets, you know, judges... Some judges, you know, they might take a, you know, liking to the other person. I mean, I know when you go to court, like when I have the male judge, 
he was much kinder and understanding. And it's, it's, it's a luck, you know what I mean? It's the luck of the draw. Like, you just don't know. And then, you know, I went to the female judge, and she was, you know, horrible. So I don't, you're not in front of them as much. I, I don't, you have to do it, you know. But could it, could it do that? I mean, I guess it could, you know. I guess I mean, one, one thing I tell people often is, given the state of the church right now, Nobody knows what's going to happen. Nobody knows how a local tribunal is going to go. No one even knows how the Roman road is going to go, given the state of the church right now. But some people, I think the people who end up collaborating with me have the mindset that I want to try everything I can try. And if the law says that I'm supposed to have these things, and it certainly would make it a lot easier for me to uphold the validity of our marriage if I had these things, they all make sense. I would rather right. ask for them and then let the chips fall where they may. Exactly, exactly. Because how do you you, how do you defend your case if you don't have the facts and proofs and what they're alleging? You have to have that. So, because you have to. I mean, this is great that you have these things you can challenge them on, whether they follow it or not. And did you get any success in that? Like, you know, I'm thinking of one situation. Um, there was a tribunal, and I'm guessing that, you know, whoever was on, on staff there was just using the form letters they've been using for years. And a respondent pointed, like, the form letter that went out to the respondent was asking the respondent to be the co-petitioner, so they would petition together. So if the respondent used the forms they, they gave him, he would be mm-hmm. petitioning along with his wife for an annulment. So he didn't, I mean, he didn't know that. He's just looking at the forms. But I knew that. So I was describing to him that this is what's going on here. And I suggested a way that he could write that to the tribunal. And the tribunal ended up writing him a really nice letter. It's like, thank you for pointing that out. We're going to change how we do it from this point forward. So it all depends, you know, like the personalities in the office. You might get a a terrific response from one tribunal and then another, you know, tribunal you won't. I mean, I don't think it's going to be different personalities and perspectives. I mean, and these people are tasked with finding the truth and they are tasked with doing it in the name of God. And they are tasked with doing it with the church's understanding of marriage. That's, that's okay. what they're tasked with doing. So that's what they're supposed to do. But then why do we have a hundred percent of our annulments being granted? So I... In some dioceses, that's a story for another top. That's a topic for another that's day. Topic. Yeah, that's, they're supposed to be doing, but one has to wonder, Betty. I'm, I'm not to, arguing with you. You know, so I think there are some, you know, improper procedures being implemented in all these I mean, dioceses. I like to give. I like to give them the benefit of the doubt. It's like, look, if if I got a job at a tribunal and I'm going to do what I was told, and they told me to use this form letter, and they told me every time you get this, put the judge's signature in here in the electronic form. I'm not going to question it. I'm just going to do what my job is. And I even, I want to give benefit of doubt to the new canon lawyer priest. If they just came out of canon law school, school is a fire hose of information. Nobody can absorb all that information. And then they go get their job at the tribunal and they're told this is how we do it. I mean, they're just, I, that's, that's how I like to view it. That these people aren't malicious. It's like, ha ha ha. Or, or they well, believe I, that they're well, healing you because you're healed if you can go find your new soulmate. Oh, it's so nice. I think some of them do mean well. I know this is off topic. They do mean well. Like I, you know, one time one priest, very nice priest, and like, did you get your, did you get your marriage investigated? You know, to see if it's not because they want you. They think, you know, it'll make it bring healing. You know, but it's, you know. But yeah, a very good priest will, will say that. You know, he well. But they also think that anything can really endow. Okay, one, I think he was like a friar. He said, well, nowadays most marriages are endowed because people are just immature. And that's not what canon law, that's not what invalidates a marriage. They don't, a lot of them just are ignorant too, you know. Or, yeah, I mean, there's the whole, there's the scholarly, there's the dissertation by Kate Godfrey Howell that I found it to be a very, I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't an easy read, but I mean, if you were a lawyer or you've been studying canon law for a while, you could plow through it. And to be really brief, she describes 
a lot of the writings that were going around in the Canon Law Society of America and their journals and the English speaking conferences and the mindset that was popular was that if people break up, you know, they have, you know, they have, they argue and disagree to the point where somebody wants a divorce, then mm -hmm. that's proof of relative incompatibility, which is proof of grave lack of discretion of judgment. And if that's what they were telling each other at their symposiums and in their proceedings of their journals and stuff. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, there's some of them really believe it. Some people really, I think some of them really, yeah. But I got other priests saying unhappy marriage is, an invalid, is a not an invalid marriage. Like, right. that's what the people most, the way society is now, if you're not happy, it's not valid. If you got divorced, civilly divorced, that, it's not valid. And, and that's where it's like, you know what? So, we can't change what we can't change. And, and you, you know what? We, I don't know. You've done this, Betty, and I've done it. I've researched this from the church fathers, the readings on this, and that's why, you know, we're authentically, not to sound like a kicker, unless you're on call, we're, we're on apology of Catholic, you know, and we're just going to follow the teachings. Right. You know, you know so, what did he say unapologetically Catholic? What did he say? Did you I don't to know. I don't know. I need to wrap up. We've gone 26 okay. minutes for the second one, so... Thank you, Irene. You helped me stay focused because this is a lot of content, and at least talking to you made it a little bit more personable. <laughs> yeah. And now it was great, and I just hope I don't get one of these, so I don't have to do this because all right, all right, most stress. All right. My heart goes out to anyone who gets an annulment. Keep fighting. Keep standing. Keep We're standing. We're not fighting. <laughs> right. Well, for truth. Okay. Thanks, Faye. Okay. Thanks, Irene. Awesome.